Welcome to the Wire Card Saga, Season 3, Lies, Spies, and Corporate Crimes. Mikhail Ryder Gordon, Managing Director of Institutional Ethics and Integrity at Affiliated Monitors. Over this podcast series, we're going to take a deep dive into the Wire Card Saga to see where it may take us literally across the globe. The Wirecard Saga is a production of the award-winning Compliance Podcast Network. Thank you, Tom. Welcome back, listeners. I have so missed you. Thank you for all the lovely messages over the past couple of months. Very much appreciated. Back from a hiatus, personal reasons, and I have queued up for you an exciting third season of Lies, Spies, and Corporate Crimes, The Wirecard Saga. Folks, there is so much to talk about. The scandal that never ceases to give. Okay, this episode and the next one, completely devoted to getting you all up to speed on the Wirecard docket. Oh yes, there is much more than one case afoot. In fact, many others that have concluded, but that have been, well, like so many little rodents dropping pellet trails of facts, and thus are continuing to produce useful and sometimes astonishing information. What did Mark Twain say? A crowded police docket is the surest of all signs that trade is brisk and money plenty. So let's go on a little courtroom safari and see what's coming before the bench. Okay. One case in, one case out, you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around, in your cell that is, if you're Marcus Braun. The court says, sit, have tea. Really, they just said that they were denying bail to Braun for the sixth or seventh time. I really am losing track. Under Germany's system, once the judge determines that you, Braun in this case, should be held in prison to waiting trial, there is no maximum duration on pretrial detention. The assumption being that most cases will get tried within six months. It did say most. You can only be kept in prison for more than six months prior to trial if there are really compelling grounds to justify the continued detention. It is the High Regional Court that reviews the detention pre-trial. Initially, after the six months, for Braun, that was back in the early winter of 2020. Doesn't time fly? and thereafter every three months. Now, remember back in late June of this year? That's right, fast forward two years. The Munich Higher Regional Court, or the OLG as it's known, had issued a new arrest warrant for Braun. I know, he was already behind bars. And I know it is easy to miss key events during summer holidays when lounging about on the riverbank, or at least the sand of the river, probably wasn't any water, or stuck in Heathrow hell searching for your lost luggage. Thanks, BA. That new arrest warrant issued by the OLG back in June, that move told us that the court was likely to accept the prosecutor's submitted charges against Braun. Or to put it another way, all of Braun's consul's protestations to the contrary, that the charges were spurious, were swatted away by the court. Now, understand, in German criminal trials, those accused of crimes don't have to enter a plea at all. There is no mandatory pleading guilty or not guilty in pre-trial hearings. Entering a plea in that phase of the proceedings is optional, really. And the plea, if you made one, it isn't even binding. Change your mind or let the judge just ignore it. That's right, the judge can elect to ignore your plea. Now, in theory, the judge taking your guilty plea, theoretically, might find the evidence didn't support the plea and acquit you. Leave it to our German practitioners listening to provide just how infrequently that's actually happened. Anyone have any ready stats? Now, you may remember that just two weeks before the new arrest warrant was issued, we're back in June... Braun had a wee little victory in court whereby the OLG lifted one of the two multi-million euro arrest orders insolvency administrator Michael Yaffa had secured late last year. Braun's counsel scored a win by convincing the OLG that one of the loans for 35 million 
that Jan Marsalek had finagled out of Wirecard entities to pay back a personal loan he owed to Braun really was accomplished without Braun's knowledge. But then the court looked at the larger 140 million euro loan and said, yeah, Braun likely knew that one. What did Charles Bukowski say? I am a series of small victories and large defeats, and I am as amazed as any other that I have gotten from here, from there to here. Braun can ink that on himself, (laughs) or his cell wall. For those listeners not up in their German civil law regime, criminal justice system, here are some key things to be aware of. Any German criminal prosecution starts with a pretrial investigation, not a pretrial hearing, an investigation. And it is those facts that form the basis of any subsequent formal indictment. Now, we reached that stage in Braun's instance when the federal, Munich federal prosecutor transferred his case to the OLG. It is at that juncture, in fact, the handoff to the court, where the big differences come into play from, say, the common law systems in the UK or the US. There are no juries in German criminal trials, and it is the presiding judge who will decide if the submitted evidence warrants a trial. Now, the judge at this point has actually already carefully reviewed the prosecutor's submitted evidence and made the determination that, yeah, this sure seems like a strong criminal case. I'm going to let it proceed to trial. Criminal trials in Germany are not adversarial. It is the judge and the prosecutor who are hearing and producing evidence both in favor and against Braun in this instance. The evidence needs to be beyond reasonable doubt to see Braun convicted. And just as we sighed and put on ice again our hopes for this endless denial of bail with no advancement to trial, the OLG gave us a preview of the next installment. That's right, listeners. On Wednesday, the 21st of September, the district court, that's the OLG, announced it had admitted the charges against Braun and two others. What does Rock, Max Robb sing? Nick line. The two others, this will be former CFO Stephen von Erfer and Flash Bellenhaus, that's Oliver from the Gulf. In its 474-page indictment, the public prosecutor's office accuses Braun, von Erfer and Bellenhaus of, we know all of this already, right? We knew it was coming, of accounting fraud, and yep, market manipulation, breach of trust in several instances, and commercial gang fraud. Now, I don't think Braun's other passports and financial activities that he engaged in under those identities paging Russell Brown. Mr. Brown, please come to the Citibank private client desk. Your unexplained money is ready. I don't think that has helped his defense of ignorance. If you've been hiding assets offshore, including in your Lichtensteinian private trust, using multiple identities, people can be forgiven for thinking you may have something to hide. The OLG has not provided us a date the trial will begin or how long they anticipate it will run. Nor have we yet heard how many witnesses will be called. But we do know the prosecutor's office has said it has identified and examined, ready, 340 companies, 450 individuals, in excess of 40 properties rated that is a whole lot of early morning wake-ups, 90 MLATs, Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty requests, to some 25 countries, and more than 1,100 to 1,100 bank accounts as relevant. Can I get a witness? As under the German criminal system, it is the judge, not the defense counsel or the prosecutor, who obtains the testimony of the witnesses, and then... Only after the judge has completed interviews are the prosecutor and the defense counsel permitted to question said witnesses. This could explain why we've been waiting so long. More intriguingly, hearsay evidence and, under certain conditions, depositions of absentee witnesses 
can be admitted as evidence in a German court. Oh, <laughs> yeah, baby. No reason for Braun to be nervous about that. He may be hanging his hat on the prosecution being unable to prove his direct role in the company's fraud. But even if Russia didn't cooperate fully with that MLAT it received from the prosecutor's office, there are definitely co-conspirators turning state's evidence, and I'm more than just Bellenhaus. Hell, even Braun's former chauffeur is tattling. And let's not forget all of those whistleblowers from within the company. Several from the late to form compliance group. Heads up compliance officers, there's still a place for you, even if they don't listen to you now. Is it just me, listeners, or do you feel a little frisson of excitement in the air? No? The indictment was admitted unchanged which means Braun's lawyers were unsuccessful in getting any of the charges dropped or reduced. It may not be as sordid as Amber and Johnny, but let's face it, we are going to hear some duck billionaire and political scuttlebutt. What a time for Braun's PR advisor, Dick Metz, to quit. Is it Braun's inability to pay Metz, what with Braun's assets having been seized and his wire card stock? of which he held much, being, well, essentially worthless now. They even auctioned off Wirecard the company's gym equipment, plastic plants, paper shredders, and cheap faux knoll office chairs a few months back. Listeners, did any of you bid on that Wirecard version of Get Off Scandal? Bronze lost everything. That Wirecard office auction, it really was dismal, wasn't it? Maybe, just maybe, Braun is holding out hope that he'll be acquitted and then he'll have money again. How, you ask? Under the German criminal justice system, if one is actually acquitted, depending on the circumstances of the case, the newly freed may be entitled to financial compensation for, ready, each day they were held in pretrial detention. Seriously. It's Germany's way of saying, Unser schlecht tut mir leid, or our bad, sorry. You can just see Marky Mark tallying each day up on the wall of his cell. I bet he gets those numbers correctly recorded. Still, let's admit it. Braun's protracted incarceration has given him ample time to learn prison etiquette. After all, he's been in custody since July 2020. Getting to 25 counts of market manipulation? That takes time. Hey, Marcus, I know you're looking at 10 years max for just one of those multiple fraud charges, but hey, silver lining here. Two years' time served, huh? The rest will fly by. And for the duration of the trial, he'll get that nearly daily taste of ersatz freedom sitting in the courtroom in your, well, now admittedly slightly mothnable turtleneck sweaters, listening as your former colleagues, auditors, advisors, confidants, and flunkies shred you. Even your general counsel has taken to shredding you in the press. Talk about distraction. 2023 will be here in no time. And with the possibility of concurrent sentences, you'll be out in what? 15 to 20? Have you noticed that every time the Munich prosecutor amends their complaint, another year of falsifying records gets added? Remember when it all got started and most people said it was limited to 2019? Oh, wire cards, fraud, it's just those 2019 books. And then, just this past June, the OLG retroactively declared the balance sheets filed by Wirecard in 2017 and 2018 to be null and void. And that subsequently rendered the dividend resolutions from those two years also null and void. Ouch. And the indictment was amended again, alleging Braun and Wirecard had been filing false financials back to 2015. Munich prosecutors team, seriously, how many times do I have to tell you it goes back further than 2015? Still. Good job continuing to reel in the years. Braun and company are alleged to have defrauded banks of at least 3.1 billion euros, right? We all know this figure. It's been hanging over, hanging about for, what, two years now? This figure is derived from the combination of, right, the $1.7 billion in loans, uh, sorry, euros in loans, and $1.4 billion in bonds. Even without the additional years, 
and all the other dirty money thrown in, adjusted for inflation, Wirecard doing what it did best, stealing. This time, thieving the record for fraud damages incurred by a German company, eclipsing Flotex from the year 2000, which only managed to defraud to the tune of two billion. Lightweight. Speaking of the dirty money, at last I'm being vindicated. Ignore the Wirecard movies and book. Even the journos are finally coming around to recognizing that the money flowing through Wirecard was mud-colored. Money laundering is being substantiated. How many years have I been saying that this was a money laundering scheme? How many years did the short sellers try to tell the investors this was a giant washing machine? Heck, even Gibson Dunn, the lawyers, reached the conclusion that Wirecard's third-party acquirer business out of Asia wasn't just a sham, it also had vast amounts of dirty cash flowing through Wirecard Bank, as dark as it gets. So speaking of those investors who want their money back, a few months back, two law firms, one in Germany and one in the Netherlands, helped form the Stichting Wirecard Investors Claim Group, SWIC, leveraging the Deutsch, oh, you're going to make me say it and my German isn't up to this, Schutverengung wird Papier, oh, forget it, DSW. Okay, I know, I just butchered that. My German is a work in progress. The DSW, founded in 1947, fields nearly 30,000 members, and this is useful. What is the purpose of SWIC with legal firepower from Berlin and Amsterdam and an investor base from the DSW? Well, SWIC was founded with the singular goal of bringing Wirecard investors together for the purposes of suing EY for their part in the Wirecard debacle. Now, I've spoken about the investor lawsuits in the past, but this is a little different. Why a foundation to seek compensation from EY for their damages as a result of the Wirecard fraud? And why the Netherlands? Thanks to Dutch law, any settlement with EY made under this particular suit brought by SWIC in the Netherlands would make it possible to achieve a collective settlement that could subsequently be declared binding on all all European investors by the Dutch courts. That's huge, folks. Settlement could come via litigation or even private settlement agreement. Via SWIC, no costs are to be incurred by the aggrieved shareholders. So the advantage of the foundation compared to, say, a capital investor test case or a class action initially comes from shortening the length of the proceedings. And SWIC's Dutch case could settle much more swiftly. And that would put paid to a lot of other European lawsuits filed under the investor test or as class actions. Better yet, via the SWIC model, it isn't just EY Germany who will be held liable, but rather the entire umbrella organization EY Global. Here's a great quote. From our point of view, this is only consistent since EY Global failed in its supervision of EY Germany and is therefore also liable for the damage to investors. And this is from Klaus Needing from the law firm involved, Needing and Bart. Quite. Now, Dutch law is going for the deep-pocketed parent. Or is it? The Swiss foreign system means that the EY parent does have more capital than the German EY entity. But largely, as we know from EY's very timely, yeah, coincidence there, breakup of its audit function from its consulting arm, it is largely the US arm of EY that accounts for the majority of EY's revenue. I'm going to momentarily digress here. The timing of the internal split of EY will ensure EY's 13,000 partners gross upwards of 8 million apiece. Yes, the leaders of 14 of EY's 15 biggest member firms, but not all of them, accounting for some 80% of its 45 billion in global revenue, the company under that name generates, that's that Swiss foreign, on September 8, 
approved putting the split of its audit and advisory businesses to a partner vote. But, partners, before you start counting your payouts, just remember that clawbacks can take a big bite out of your meal. And EY China? It said it won't divvy up its business. It says it's going to keep its audit and consulting groups across the PRC, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, Mongolia, one single part of the EY Global Network. And EY Europe. Let's just say EY still a little unclear on investor sentiment toward their role in Wirecard's fall from grace. EY's UK chair was quoted only last week saying that splitting out the audit function from the consulting side of the house meant, quote, audit quality is going to be better. In other words, Hyval Ball, that's the EY UK chair. You're saying that hitherto audit quality wasn't that great? <laughs> I'm sure investors around the world of the companies EY is serving as auditor to are greatly relieved of that one. Ball went on to elaborate on why splitting the EY audit practice out from the rest of the firm was going to be a net positive, maybe for the fling partners. Discussing EY's auditors as being, at the moment, pulled in all sorts of ways by the other businesses, and therefore hitherto unable to focus on their audit work at hand. So, so that's what happened. Well, now it all makes sense. It really isn't EY's fault. This whole wire guard thing... Where the EY auditors missed catastrophic amounts of accounting fraud and money laundering over a decade plus, it all could have been avoided, caught even, if only EY's audit teams hadn't been pulled, Ball's words, in other directions. This firm split will sort that out, won't it? According to Ball, the EY Global Audit Group will now, quote, get what it needs. What, like a swift kick? I'd quote fictional former footballer Roy Kent's immortal word here, but I think it goes without saying. The mind boggles at the historic deficiencies these poor auditors must have suffered. First chairs of the securities lit teams? Leading the suits against EY? Just package Ball's interview and put it in toward the front portion of your exhibits. Jeez. Is SWIC the only group of investors suing? Mm, not by half. German law firm Schöp and Schöp and partner Steinwald have some 1,300 lawsuits pending. Managing partner Wolfgang Schöp has gone on public record telling Wirecard investors to view the timing of EY's plans to break up the company as not coincidental. He went so far as accusing EY of trying to shirk its responsibility. No, filthy, say it ain't. He has also cautioned investors not to rely solely upon the Swick suit, but to avail themselves of litigation financing available and drag EY into court sooner than later. A little self-serving a recommendation, perhaps, but then again, more successful litigants, smaller payouts for all, so advising folks to pile on may only give courts reason to limit payouts. Securities litigation filed by German retail and institutional investors, including banks who lent to Wirecard, but who are not part of SWIC, are arguing that EY breached its professional duty by auditing alleged escrow funds and then failing to disclose further balance sheet manipulations at Wirecard. Really, only two of the many failures here, but who's counting? The argument goes that under the German BGB, that's the Burgerlich's Gazette book, sections 826 and 31, EY, contra bonus mores, that's against good morals, really in the absence of possessing any, willfully caused damage. Recall, the higher regional court of Munich issued a notice basically saying, yeah, we can't rule out that EY has some liability here. Sounds like the Braun case, doesn't it? So thus far, around 35,000 aggrieved shareholders have registered with SWIC, and the damage is anticipated to exceed 1.5 billion euros. 
but that's just the SWIC pool. Now, a first limitation period in the Wirecard case looms at the end of 2023, but that still leaves time for the pool of complaints and complainants to grow and for EY to take their money and run. And speaking of investor lawsuits, in the U.S., Wirecard securities litigation has seen the consolidation of several cases, but progress in these civil actions Ooh, it's crawling sluggishly through the U.S. courts, which grossly backlog thanks to COVID. The Brown and Del Pagado case, consolidated class action, saw their motion to transfer the case approved and the stay lifted in late June of this year. Now here, the defendants are not just Braun, but Marsalek, Van Noop, Steidel, aha, Suzanne, you've been flying under the radar too long, darling, and Matthias, and of course, EY. And with the Munich Regional Court ruling in early May that included documenting EY's failures as an auditor to Wirecard, remember, I just mentioned the court invalidated the 2017 and 2018 Wirecard balance sheets. Well, that means those who held shares, bonds, or derivatives in Wirecard may now have a better place to turn for recompense than just what Yafa is scraping together under the insolvency proceeding. But investors, before you start planning your reinvestment with all that money you think EY will be paying out, reality check. One, EY splinters, partners take profits. It's going to be considerably more difficult to get full compensation out of the audit arm, or you will end up attempting to sue individual partners. Ugh, much smaller pool, more litigation. Two, EY will make a claim against its insurance, whereupon the EY v. its insurer's litigation will take at least a decade of adversarial proceedings, benefiting certain members of the legal profession, but few others. Yafa is now anticipated to reclaim dividend and tax payments Wirecard made to shareholders. Why? Now, remember those invalidated annual reports 2015 to 2019? This may hurt a wee bit, but all those profits those shareholders made from Wirecard in those years? They were based on false numbers. That's why the shareholders are... Only stop and think about this for a moment. If you were a Wirecard shareholder, you actually benefited from the company's fraud the value of your shares went up because the company was cooking the books and appearing wildly profitable, which drove the share price up. Shares up, dividends paid out. Fast forward to today. You've lost money because your shares are now worth bupkis and you're cross, rightfully, and you want your money back. But you made money in those duplicitous years. Arguably, as a shareholder, you even profited from money laundering crimes as the profits from laundering were genuine. So now, Yafa, who is tasked with recovering monies for financial institutions who made loans and got burned by Wirecard, for vendors to whom Wirecard owes money, and other types of claimants, not shareholders, Yafa is going to ask for those dividend payments back. Ugh, Herr Braun, it must hurt just thinking about how much of your money was derived from dividends earned in those years. Will you, like Job, rent your mantle, shave your head, and fall down knowing the Lord gave and will now take away? Herr Braun must construct a Maro Umkopf to keep such thoughts away. Back to my list of why it is going to be a very long while indeed before anyone receives much of anything from all of these legal actions. Four. You have to share what will no doubt be a significantly smaller sum than your investment loss out of the pool that any court approves. Why? Because there are so many suits and theories being tried. Yes, Yafa's bankruptcy administration of Wirecard in the U.S. is winding up, but his efforts in other countries remain open and lawsuits are piling up around the world. So, For instance, in an effort to identify a party with genuine financial resources, say, Germany, the country, we now see investors and other aggrieved parties 
continuing to file suits against Boffin for failing in its supervision, asserting liability is a breach of Boffin's third-party-related official duty. Whilst thus far, German courts have dismissed these cases as failing under Section 4.4 of the Law on the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority, that's the argument there being that Boffin only acts in the public interest. Oh, it's difficult to suppress a snort of derision here. You can see why claimants aren't quite giving up and some clever German practitioner just may find the theory that survives that third-party test. Finance minister, it may be time to draw down on that reserve. Suddenly being a nation of savers doesn't look as attractive, does it? And let us not forget that in addition to EY, there is another pool of deep pockets out there that now has angry wirecard investor fingers feeling in the linings for more than just pocket lint. In April of this year, the Karlsruhe Higher Regional Court ruled against an insurance company that didn't want to pay out on investor policies that would cover acts by Wirecard board members Braun and Marsalek. Hear this. That's right. A small-time investor, he held stock in Wirecard worth just about €8,000 in May of 2020. He lost his money in June 2020 when the bloated carcass of Wirecard beached itself. Stock no longer worth €8,000. So he, the investor, turned to his legal protection insurance company for cover. He wanted to sue for damages against the former Wirecard board members and Braun and Marsalek and the auditors from EY. And as, as all us lawyers know, Litigation ain't cheap. This small investor didn't have sufficiently deep pockets or available cash to mount his lawsuit against EY and the Wirecard executives because, hey, that's expensive. So he turned to his insurance company and asked them to pay for it under his policy. It was a loss, after all. The insurance company said, nine, we don't see this likely to succeed and it will cost us way too much to litigate. So our little David sued his insurance Goliath. I guess he could afford the basic filing fees. First, the regional court in Mannheim upheld his claim and then the higher regional car court in Karlsruhe did too, instructing the insurance, you have a duty to pay this guy's legal expenses as he proceeds to sue the aforementioned parties. Further, it told the insurance company, no, you may not appeal. In fact, said the Karlsruhe court, we think there is a reasonable prospect of success in actions against Marsalek, Braun, and heck, even EY. Why does the court think the investor's lawsuit may succeed? It rightly pointed out that it isn't yet clear what assets Braun and Marsalek and others may have and where they may be hidden. Speaking of those who know where some of the hidden assets may be parked, a few months back, the Singapore financial authorities charged Henry O'Sullivan with two additional counts of abetting Shamagaratnam, much more on offshore islander Hank later this season. So much more. Henry racks up additional charges, but he wasn't alone. On the same day, May 5th, 2022, if you're tracking, former director of Strategic Corporate Investments Private Limited, let's call it Skip. Funny, like Skip Town with the money, right? It's a shell, Skip, related to Citadel, Shan, Sendro Group, and O'Sullivan. Former director of Skip, Thilagaratnam, S.O. Rajaratnam was charged in Singapore court with offences under the company's same day as O'Sullivan and got those two additional charges. Now, Rajaratnam, he's now looking at least 10 years in Singapore prison. Funny the timing of the additional charges against O'Sullivan and old Thilagaratnam being charged, ain't it? What else has the wire card docket of 2022 given us? Remember Alexander Vuchok? 
Badi de Marsalik, Nikki von Rintelen, O'Sullivan, and the former Libyan intelligence officer Rami al He who was indicted back in January of this year. You remember, he of IMS Capital, Tui, Gumu, oh, just go back and re-listen to episodes 11 and 23. Okay, recall at the time of Vuchok's arrest, the indictment from the Munich District Court included no fewer than 26 counts of money laundering, fraud, and violations of companies' law, e.g. dodgy accounting. And remember, prosecutors alleged Vuchok assisted in the laundering of some 22 million euros that had been embezzled from Wirecard. The prosecutors said he used another 8 million likely sourced from purloined Wirecard funds to (laughs) decorate his office in Switzerland and refurbish his luxury place in Munich. Remember all of this? Alexei maintained the IMS office at Marsalek's pseudo-lair in Munich. Yeah, see, now it's coming back to you. How have things been going for Vuchok? Yes, it's true. One of his companies, Bionovate Technologies, took a total nosedive and, according to the bourse a few days ago, is now worth less than one one-hundredth of a cent. Cue more investors seeking recompense for lost money. A semiconductor company with nearly 8 million shares still out, but not worth a farthing. And true, an insolvency administrator in Cyprus had to wind down his Turbina Energy a year ago, August, and... Recall the whole digit, digit ID and human data AG smoke and mirrors game. We th- honestly, let's be honest, we thought Vuchok had run out of runway, so to speak. But it appears Mr. Vuchok cut a deal with the Munich prosecutors. Why do I say this? Remember, Braun has two dozen plus charges out against him and is considered such a flight risk he's languished in pretrial detention for two plus years. Alexander Vuchok, with his 20 plus charges, is out and about savoring his freedom. So much so that in May of this year, we saw Mr. Vuchak speaking at a conference in Luxembourg. Described as an entrepreneur, an investor, and corporate development for IMS Capital Partners, you know, the company that is central to the money laundering charges against him, he was a speaker at a conference. Yes, that's right. At the Space Resources Week 2022, and this was not a conference dedicated to making your office footprint larger or smaller, but rather about space, as in the cosmos. (laughs) No, listeners, you can't make this stuff up. In May, Vuchak of IMS Capital Partners was a panelist on, wait for it, how to make the moon bankable. He and the head of Innovation and Ventures Office of the European Space Agency and a couple of other panelists opined on investing in the moon. Now, given Alexander's stellar career with investments thus far, cleaning questionable proceeds aside, I think letting him invest your money is less a moonshot and more like sending your cryptocurrency off with Major Tom on a one-way journey to a galaxy far away. Who would have thunk this never-ending story of dirty money would have us chatting about the European space? So who and what exactly did the well-connected Mr. Vuchok give up to the Munich court? I think it reasonable to imagine O'Sullivan, von Rintelen, and Braun feeling vaguely nauseous at the thought of the information he shared. One wonders what his Russian handlers think about this turn of events. Shinedi Chimchenko. Thoughts? Text me. With truly large criminal conspiracy, it never fails to prove fascinating who decides to confess. As we saw back in the spring of this year in the Southern District of New York, Avram Azari confessed to his part in the greater wirecard crime spree. Don't remember Azari? This was the Israeli guy who was indicted in the U.S. back in late August 2019 for felony computer hacking, wire fraud, ID theft, fraud by false identity, conspiring others to hack, or in the official parlance, intentionally accessing a computer without authorization. Avi, let's just call him Avi, who in court proceedings had selective facility with English. It seemed whenever he didn't like a question or didn't want to hear bad news, then suddenly he required his Hebrew translator. And who was given a bit of dramatic swooning, really. Avi was caught by the FBI spearfishing, and he would swoon whenever this was brought up. 
For those of you not up on your low-level, high-value cybercrimes, spear phishing is the targeting of a specific individual and their accounts for the purposes of hacking. These days, it isn't unusual for hackers to even employ a little machine learning to pick up the tenor and feel of your email correspondence or texts from close friends and family and then design a message that reads like something they would send, only it contains malware or linked malware that then provides the hackers with access to your accounts or system. Public service announcement here, listeners. Never, ever click on any link that anyone send you electronically, not on your phone, not in your email or text, just don't. Spear phishing links will often take the user to a site that, yeah, sure, it looks genuine, like their firm login page or their bank account or social media login. But alas, it's nothing more than a means by which to purloin your credentials. And Avi conspired with others to target critics of Wirecard, like activist hedge funds based in New York, there's our venue, journalists and others via spear phishing. Now, remember the whole Indian hacking group, Beltrox, Axe, Infotech, that Marsalek had retained to hack critics of the company during the low moments of Wirecard public relations, like every time they were accused of fraud between 2014 and 2020, six long years. Remember Citizen Lab's efforts to unmask Beltrox? Go all the way back to episode two from July 2020 if you need a refresher. Beltrox, who hadn't just worked for Wirecard, but for a dozen major law, U.S. law firms, PR companies, corrupt governments. Oh, yes, they targeted human rights activists, environmental protection groups, elected officials. Avi was at the center of a lot of this, running hacking teams, targeting these folks, not just those in New York, but around the world. He was somewhere between a broker, a team leader, and a contractor to Beltrox. So, Avi's case wended its way through the U.S. federal court system from the fall of 2019 to the courthouse steps in early 2022. And then suddenly, on April 20th, 2022, Avi pled guilty to counts 1, 3, and 4 of the superseding indictment. Hacking, wire fraud, ID theft. Not that two hots and a cop provided by the U.S. government wasn't pleasant enough, but Azari decided maybe he could shed some additional light on who paid his group and who they shared that stolen information with. The extent of his cooperation has been sealed, but each new guilty plea brings a new indictment on its heels. If we cast an eye over the landscape of just U.S. cases since 2009 that have featured those with a nexus to Wirecard, or who used Wirecard to help facilitate criminal activities, a pattern emerges. U.S. v. Shoot, Svetkov, U.S. Poker Stars, Selesnev, Bitar, Varshek, Williams, Moby Limited, Sharma, Durov, Telegram, Ton, Mindshare, Vigand, Akavan, Azari, Sharma. Ooh, the list just keeps going on and on. And this list doesn't even include the civil actions filed by private companies or Karimi's case against Deutsche Bank. A decade-plus of cases with no let-up in sight and more dirt about to come to light from the trials in other countries. These days, mere propinquity seems to be all it takes. Is that why two executives, Faris Antun and David Tassilo, resigned from online porn behemoth MindGeek a couple of months ago? Oh, listeners, in part two of the docket, the next episode, we are truly headed into the sewer, or the veins of Wirecard, if you will, because there is one more very recently filed case I haven't yet discussed that it's worthy of its own episode. Stay tuned. I'm Mikhail Ryder-Gordon. As always, huge thanks to you listeners. My thanks to Tom Fox and the Compliance Podcast Network. Pull out your wellies and waders, and I'll see you back here next week for the docket part two on lies, spies, and corporate crimes, the Wirecard Saga. This is Tom Fox. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wirecard Saga. The Wirecard Saga is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you will join us again for our next episode.
This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.